The Mortimer Rare Book Room is so pleased to co-sponsor the second annual uh, Northampton Book and Book Arts Fair, including our speaker this afternoon. I'm Karen Kukiel, and it is my great honor as the interim curator of Rare Books to introduce my professional colleague and friend, Ruth R. Rogers. Ruth is the curator of special collections at Wellesley College. She is responsible for 150 medieval and Renaissance manuscripts and over 40,000 books and contemporary artist books. As a member of the art department, she teaches a full credit course every spring on the history of the book from manuscript to print. She also lectures to more than 80 classes per year, which is staggering. <laughs> Artist books, as you know, bridge traditional books and contemporary art. Meaning is derived through the sum of their elements, a fusion of image, word, and materiality. Over the past decade, Ruth Rogers has become an authority in this genre. Ruth organized the ABC, the Artist Book Conference held at Wellesley in 2005. She was a juror for the Minnesota Center for the Book Arts International Artist Book Award and the College Book Art Association Members Exhibition. She has also curated a number of exhibitions and written the following catalogs, and I'm just gonna read them there, it's impressive. Resonance and Response, Artist Books from Special Collections at Wellesley in 2005, Beyond Words, Artist Books, University Art Gallery, Sewanee, University of the South in 2006. Rare Beauty, Contemporary Visions in Book Arts, Hartford Art School, University of Hartford, 2012. I think some of you in the audience probably exhibited there. Seductive Alchemy, Books by Artists, Department of Visual Arts, Texas Women's University in 2015. Reading with the Senses, 54 International Contemporary Artist book, Books, College of Art and Design, Lesley University in 2016. And on May 3rd, she gave the Arthur P. Williams Lecture for the MFA in Book Arts at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. This afternoon, Ruth Rogers will deconstruct how we read a selection of international artist books through a consideration of typography, pacing, form, and material. Please join me in welcoming Ruth Rogers, whose keynote talk is entitled, Layers of Perception, the Unwritten Language of Artist Books. Thank you, everyone. It's really lovely to see so many of you here, and especially so many familiar faces. I mostly still remember your names, too. <laughs> Can you hear me OK? Yes. OK. Um, I have a gravelly voice. It's uh, because I'm just getting over the election still. I lost it as soon as uh, it happened. So um, I hope you can hear me OK. And there is a handout. I, do you all have it? And if you don't, I don't know where the extra copies are. But there you have the door, I hear. OK, thank you. Um, and thank you, Karen, for that extreme introduction. Um, I didn't expect you to read all those titles. Um, some of the catalogs, if any of you are interested, are still available. The last two are available on uh, blurb.com. So uh, you can, I don't make any money off of this. I just want you to know that. You can buy it and see the books that are in there. What I'm really happy about is to see so many artists here people I know through their work, and it makes me really happy to talk about the work of artists who I know, so thank you again. So let's get started. <clears throat> As a curator in a rare book library, students and visitors often ask me a question. What is your oldest book? To which I usually respond with my own question. Do you mean printed book or manuscript? Do you mean a codex or other format? As you all know, there is not a simple answer because it depends on how you define book. Acknowledging that a specialized group like this one, that, like the one gathered here, is already well aware of earlier forms of the book, let's just remember some developments along the evolutionary line. 
keeping this in mind for a comparison with artist books later on. Starting with the earliest form of the book, a 5,000-year-old clay tablet written in cuneiform. And next, portable wax tablets from ancient Greece for erasing and rewriting the prototype of the codex. Actually, the prototype of the palm, palm pilot, if you remember those. <laughs> and next, oh, roughly along the evolutionary line, the scroll, although the scroll and the portable wax tablets were simultaneous, they existed together. This is, a, a four, uh, this is a, an 18th century Hebrew one from Wellesley's collection. Remembering that this had to be read slowly and re-rolled, so the way that one reads a scroll is quite different from the way that one reads a codex. And next, this is an illuminated 14th century manuscript, also from Wellesley's collections, to inspire devotion to the Virgin Mary. This one is so beautiful that I had to give you a close-up of it so you could see the gold. This was meant for reflection, reflection in the literal sense that the gold leaf reflected the light, but also because it inspired devotion, and this was very important in the reading of manuscripts, devotional manuscripts. This is a, a, tom leaf, a Tomil palm leaf book. This is from the 19th century, and this is an arithmetic. It was held together by a cord. And this is the binding, the jeweled and charmed binding of an Armenian printed Bible from the 18th century. This was used to ward off the evil eye. Very important when you think about how religious books were meant to hold the word of God. It somehow makes sense that it would have jewels and charms on it to ward off the evil eye. You see this in Armenian Bibles particularly. And this is a colonial American primer for teaching children the catechism. It's a horn book to be held in the hand. Jumping forward 250 years, we have another <laughs> book to be held in the hand, portable and erasable, thinking back to that, to the Egyptian uh, wax tablets. <clears throat> so what's old is new and back again. We also have to scroll to read that. Just think about the meaning of scrolling. So clearly, technology changes the way we produce books, sometimes making past techniques obsolete, sometimes merging them and using them concurrently. <coughs> Visual communication has always been a blend of text, image, and medium, from illuminated manuscripts to advertising poster, posters to social media platforms. The benefit of working in a collection of rare books alongside contemporary artist books is that I'm constantly reminded of what came before. And the parallels, the most recent revolution in digital technology being yet another punctuation in the timeline of book text production. Since the theme of this talk is understanding artist books as layered reading, let's look back again to the pre-digital age. Authors and publishers have long experimented with techniques to allow nonlinear and multiple layers of reading, such as this. This is a Volvel with movable paper disks for calculating the lunar phases from a 16th century astronomy book. And this is the late 18th century landscape gardener Humphrey Repton's famous book, published he published highly acclaimed and expensively produced books of plans for his wealthy clientele. These before and after views incorporated hand-colored aquatints in a long oblong format, ingeniously using pasted in fold-away flaps to show his redesigned parks, lakes, and stately homes in one frame on the page. Here we have it with one flap open, and next we have it with both flaps open. This type of reimagining a scene is easily done on a screen now with hypertext. Yet to Repton's readers in the 1790s, his changeable view books were a novelty. This is a 1690 medical flat book. It reached the height of its popularity as a teaching tool with hand-colored plates that lifted up to reveal the organs and muscular and vascular systems. 
This is a 1900 version. The explora exploration of historical book forms helps us to understand our visual and technological inheritance and to remind us that the roots of nonlinear and non-textual languages of reading are not new. Throughout the history of books, text, image, typographic design, and materiality have been intertwined in making meaning. The subliminal, the subliminal ways that we read have much to do with these paratexts, as book historian Roger Chartier and others have emphasized. With similar subtlety, the contemporary artist book acts upon the reader through the mediation of form, substance, color, pacing, personal and cultural associations, memory, sound, even smell. Though librarians and critics continue to engage in a debate over what is a book, I propose instead that the focus should be on the reading of the book and not on its formal elements. To cite Chartier again, he, he writes, quote, the space between text and object, which is precisely the space in which meaning is constructed, has too often been forgotten. In this talk, excuse me, <laughs> sorry about my voice. In this talk, I will examine the contemporary artist book as provocateur and siren, transcending the traditional academic and linguistic boundaries while offering multiple modes of reading. At a time when the gulf between text and physical book is ever expanding through digital surrogates, artist books continue to engage the reader's senses in ways that are both traditional and novel, haptic, meditative, and associative. Here then is my selection of contemporary works by internationally accomplished artists and authors. I've chosen them because they combine a high level of craft with serious and timeless content. They're not trendy, overproduced, or self-reflexive. And in fact, they're often opaque. They demand close attention and multiple readings. I will deconstruct them just enough to elucidate the languages with which we read beyond the text. This is Pierre Walusinski's L'Encre des Tranchées, published in Paris in 2001. I hope you all have your list so you can make check marks. Mm -hmm. Though he was trained at the Ecole Estienne in Paris in traditional graphic arts processes such as etching, engraving, typography, lithography, and letterpress, Pierre Walusinski has made anything but a traditional book here. It is astonishing in its pathos and raw emotional power but only if one is committed to uncovering the layers of text slowly by unfolding and turning and squinting. His inspiration was a text that was published in paperback when he was a student. This was published in 1998. I apologize for the library stamp on the corner there. That's typical defacing. These are letters written from French soldiers who wrote to their families from the battlefront and trenches of World War I. Some of them were wounded and recovered to live out their lives. Others were executed for supposed desertion, and some never made it home, found with letters hidden in their uniforms or on their, in their hands when they died. The artist chose to use a wide rectangular page spread to resemble a cinematic format and loose signatures that must be unfolded like a letter. These features compel the reader to feel the anxiety and fear of opening what is contained within. The title he gave it, L'Encre des Tranchées, has a metaphorical meaning because the letters were inked from the trenches of the war, but also because he accomplished it with etching, a method that, as you probably know, requires laying ink in the grooves of a metal plate. This is a detail of the cover. Here you can see the names printed of the seven men whose letters he selected to print. That would be on your left. The whole project preoccupied the 20-year-old Walusinski so completely that he traveled to the archives Historial de la Grande Guerre near Amiens in France, where the original letters were donated in order to find and photograph the handwriting of the soldiers whose letters he chose to include. And here you can see the handwriting with his own letterpress printing. Though many graphic designers and artists have used this technique of forming images from words, famously the shaped poetry of Apollinaire or Iliazd, 
Waluszynski's typographic treatment of the soldier's letters has an explosive impact on the reader that only enhances the horror of the words. On the left side of the page is the letter from Michel Topiak, dated February 14, 1915, and it starts out in complete descriptive sentences. Quote, when we arrived here in the month of November, the fields were magnificent as far as the eye could see, full of beets, dotted with rich farms and rows of haystacks. Now it is the land of death. All the fields are blown up, trampled, the farms burned and in ruins. I've never seen anything so horrible." End quote. In this detail, one can see how the artist took apart the lines of text and reshaped them to resemble bare fields and skeletal trees. Note the diminishing size of the type as you read down the page, and lighter and lighter inking to convey distortion and confusion. Even in his use of the repetitive words, tak tak, one hears the distant guns of the battle. Here's the trade edition that I showed you earlier, open to the page where the final letter of Jean-Louis Croix is printed. He was mortally wounded by a grenade to his thigh, and he was found with the letter to his parents in his hands, written while hoping to be rescued, hiding in a shell hole. If anything so heartbreaking could be amplified, the artist did just that, with his typographic interpretation. The hole in the page that you see in the right was made by allowing etching acid to eat into the surface of the metal plate, creating a lower surface depression. He then attacked it by hand with nails and steel tools to create the pocked surface. Lightening up a bit. <laughs> I've been accused of having a dark side and it seems to always come out in these artist books that I choose, but this is life. This is a uh, Clemens Tobias Lange um, calumet based on the poems of Giuseppe Ungaretti in Italian, French, and German. Giuseppe Ungaretti's spare and symbol symbolic poetry gave him the label hermetic, and it seems the perfect inspiration for the book aesthetics of the multilingual and cerebral book artist Tobias Lange. It starts with a prayer for the earth by Ungaretti and five particular geographical maps of the earth, Oceania, Australia, Europe, North America, Africa, and the Atlantic. These maps, however, are not typical. They're printed with white ink on black sumi painted Japanese papers that whisper and crinkle like something ancient when you turn them. Thousands of tiny shapes of aircrafts, which you can see here, they look like stars, but trust me, they're aircrafts, captured online from flight radar and calculated from flight information, create the positions of the aircrafts. Each map shows one particular moment of the day with all civil aircrafts in flight in that moment. On the previous page of each map are printed two numbers. First, how many aircrafts are in flight, and second, how many languages are spoken in that area of the earth? The number of languages spoken is inversely proportional to the number of aircrafts. In the prospectus, Lange writes in his terse manner, quote, the more we fly, the more our languages disappear. Where the money moves, the variety of all cultural goods are fading, taste of food, fashion, daily life, thinking, and even philosophy. Adap even philosophy adapts to one kind with access to everybody. Or, to turn it positive, in Calumet, images of nature on thin Nepal paper for each chapter give space for our imagination to remember the beauty of our planet. So do Ungaretti's poems for the culture of men." End quote. I'll show you more slides from this book so you can try to get an idea of it. This is America, North America, all the paper is his own handmade paper. Turning the page, you see the full page spread. And then the number of languages with the poem on the left. I'm afraid it's rather dark, but the number of languages is 46 for America, 5,647 flights. And then the continent appears with just flight radar captured, 
captured these aircraft. So the map is really a visualization of the aircrafts in flight at one moment of the day. And next, Africa, Afrique. The reason it's in three languages is because it's completely translated in all three languages. And the beautiful landscape as you turn the page. And then the darkness and the number of languages and the poem Calumet. Calumet. The number of languages is 1,895, but only 222 flights. And here I'm jumping ahead for a moment so you can see how bare the continent appears, just the outlines with the aircrafts. And now I'll go back to the previous slide so I can read you the poem Calumet. This is uh, my translation from the German. I know a country where the sun paralyzes even scorpions. Alone there, this wolf lamb sleeps. He alone would not be a stranger in this climate of death. This wolf lamb, an exile everywhere. So there is the continent once again. This is Ken Botnick's B is for Beckett. How many of you know this book? Anyone? Very few. Oh, I know the, the binder knows it. <laughs> Not this one. Okay. This is, a, this is a conceptual book, a little different from the last conceptual book, which I'd call a cerebral one. Um, this is a, B is for Beckett with a poem by Mary Jo Bang one-line poem published in St. Louis by Ken Botnick. Beckett's writing became more minimalist and provocative as he got older. Mary Jo Bang's one-line poem is an homage to the man. <laughs> that's it. Shall I do that one more time for you? That's the, that's the lower four edge. And that's the whole book, but not. The act of turning pages and waiting for the text to be revealed on what appears to be blank pages is exactly the subversive challenge that Beckett is known for. So let's think about this. One can only carefully, fully read, one can only fully read the text when the book is closed. And the weight of the book is inversely proportional to the amount of text inside. So we have a weighty book with almost nothing within. It's all a big joke on the reader, or is it? It is the essence of Beckett, and I think he would have loved it. I once asked Botnick to explain his use of lead for the covers, and he replied, quote, I really like the way it relates to printing types, but in this case, a role reversal of sorts. It's usually the lead making the impression, now it's the lead taking the impression. That inversion is very poetic to me, indeed. Lead also has the connotation of being dangerous, like Beckett as a writer flaunting the rules of form. That's the cover. There are only 10 copies of this. This is Jacques Fournier, the 6th of April, 1944. Jacques Fournier started out as an accountant in Montreal, then studied bookbinding and found his true métier. He is the publisher and designer at Edition, Edition Rosselin in Montreal, where for the past 23 years he's been committed to working in collaboration with international poets, photographers, and artists. A plain yellow box with a barely legible title confronts the reader. You can't know this from looking at it, unfortunately, because you can't feel it but the box is very heavy, probably 10 pounds. The meaning of its weight becomes clear after one lifts the cover and discovers the content. Lifting the lid of the container, one finds a photograph of a, photograph of a desolate farmhouse landscape in the bottom of the box with the names of 44 children printed on the sides with their ages and the, time they were, and the ages at the time they were deported to their deaths. Fournier's choice of a reflective coated paper on which he printed the names was carefully considered. If he had used white paper and printed with black ink, the effect would not be the same. 
In this case, the landscape of the village seems to embrace or engulf the children on all sides. You can see that better in this close-up. The terrible weight of the crime committed against them is echoed in the heaviness of the lead-weighted box, which is like a coffin holding the names of the children while they remain suspended above the town and will not be buried. As one of my students once commented, how can an empty container be so full? And I must say, of all the books I've ever purchased, this is by far one of the best. It's, it's hard to think of anything more perfect than this. And I don't care whether you call it a book or not. <laughs> this is Engel by Ines von Kettelholt, with poems by Raphael Alberti. The collection of poems, Sobre los Angeles, or Concerning the Angels, is generally acknowledged as one of the most significant works of modern Spanish poetry. Alberti published this volume of poems in 1929. Years later, he described the darkness that came upon him in those days, due in part to the dire political situation in Spain in the 1920s, and also to a, because of a doomed love affair. The lost paradise of the opening poem of the cycle is a reference to all that he lost. He wrote, and then the angels <coughs> revealed themselves to me, not as Christian bodily angels of the sort found in beautiful paintings of, or prints, but instead as irresistible forces of the spirit, malleable to the most turbid and secret states of my nature. The angels of Alberti's poems wander alienated and displaced through recurring landscapes of obscure and abandoned cities, cities with streets once lively and familiar but now walled off, soulless cities in which both angels and men have lost their way. A paradise lost. That indeed is the title of the first poem, printed over an image of the Frankfurt train station with its wide arched and dark vaulted entrance. With astonishing visual images that echo the surrealist language of the poet, the artist, Ines von Kettelhout, seamlessly fused text, image, and expansive space on the page. She made these cinematic and dreamlike photographs by mounting a camera on her shoulder and taking long exposure shots while strolling, uh, excuse me, while taking long exposure shots through her camera lens chance encounters, and her images are the result of chance encounters, but it's an element of chance that fits very well with the surrealist poetry esprit. The objectivity of photography with anonymous subjects and places and blurred fo focus is an appropriate medium for this poetry. This is not to minimize in any way the all-encompassing all artistic vision and poetic sympathy evident on every page random and yet eerily specific to the text, the resulting angels seem to mysteriously rise out of the air. Look at that. How, for example, could Kettlehote have captured in a single frame this shot, this most perfect embodiment of the poem, The Good Angel? And I'll read it to you. Once again, my translation. One year when I was sleeping, Someone I did not expect stopped at my window. Rise, and my eyes saw feathers and swords. Behind, mountains and seas, clouds, beaks and wings, sunsets and dawns. Look at her there, her dream hanging on nothing. This is Paulette Myers Rich, Ghost Poems for the Living, 13 sonnets by Shakespeare with distillations and images. In the words of the artist, this is a meditation on beauty and time's passage, what the eye beholds in beauty's fullness and what is overlooked when beauty is stripped away and transformed into a different state. Let me do that one more time for you. The positive, in exactly the same position, a new poem emerges, the ghost. 
Myers Rich leaves Shakespeare's words in exactly the same position on the page, finding the residue or the ghost poems within. The minimalism of this, of this book is its beauty and its strength. Her choice of an exposed spine, her choice of an exposed spine sewn with black thread compounds the metaphor. At this point, you may, getting the impre you may be getting the impression that I'm attracted to minimalism. Here's a more minimal one. This is Harriet Bart in the Presence of Absence, published in 2002, a book that I didn't have the wit to buy when I had the chance. And now it's one of my books that got away. I'd be happy to buy one from somebody. <laughs> this book is a paradox. At once, both wide open literally translucent, but closed and impenetrable. One can meditate on it and be changed by its aura, but it has no beginning and no end. What could be more fitting for an exploration of memory and longing? The text is a prose poem written by Bart, who begins with the word for longing in 10 different languages. We know we are in the company of multitudes and that time or place is irrelevant because absence knows no boundaries, no time, no place. The text is laser cut into the translucent pages, the words revealed only in the negative, in the negative space of their absence. We turn the page expecting new words, a narrative, but no, the text is the same on every page. No let up, no relief, no change. The exposed spine and the Pyrex covers allow light to flow through the book, whether it is open or closed. This is the physical embodiment of longing, universal, penetrating, and fluid. The binding and its accompanying box are by Jill Jevney. This is Carolee Campbell's The Persephones with poems by Nathaniel Tarn, published in 2009. Campbell is another artist who listens to the text and over a long gestation period conceives of the form and materiality and material completely in service to the poetry. Here she has collaborated again with the California poet Nathaniel Tarn, whose lyrics seem to be draped in a shimmering nonverbal cloth in her hands. These are plaintive poems in the imagined voice of Persephone, who, as you know, <clears throat> was carried off into the underworld by Hades and was allowed to return for only half of the year in the upper world before returning to the depths of the earth for the other half of the year. Campbell illustrated the book by painting on both the front and back of sheets, of white sheets, using sumi ink and salt, rendering every book unique. When interviewed about this treatment, Campbell said, and I quote, I wanted the essence of both the gods in their celestial heavens and the atmosphere of Hades, Hades the god of the underworld as well as Hades the place, with its eternity of dismal smoke and soot and drear. The pages remained unbound to add to the expansive quality I wanted to achieve. Keeping in mind the layers of meaning in this, the, the layers of meaning this mineral conveys in the context of the underworld, there is powerful interlude that happens every time one comes to the end of a poem and embarks on a new one. Like Persephone, the reader first has to pause at the entrance to it. White crystal layers of salt on a carpet of black like the night. I was immediately drawn to the supple limp vellum wrapper that encloses the text sheets here. A full skin sacrificed for each book with all the organic animal antiquity that only an ancient material like parchment can connote. And finally, this is Veronica Shapers. It's a mouthful of numbers, as you can see, so I call it the giant squid book. <laughs> these, these are poems by Doris Grünbein in German with a translation into Japanese. That's because Veronica Shapers lived for 15 years in Japan and worked there 
learned the language, worked with Japanese artists, but she's a German artist. The discovery of the first giant squid off the coast of Japan in the waters of Tokyo, south of Tokyo, in 2004 was the inspiration for this book, which is a hybrid exploration of marine biology, poetic myth, and virtuosic craft. And these slides will never do it justice, no matter how beautiful the slides are. She began by collaborating with German poet Doris Grünbein, who had just published two poems in response to the news of the discovery. He gave permission for her to use two of these and also contributed another, Remora, which he wrote expressly for this book. Not only an artist, but a researcher who always investigates her subject, Shapers interviewed Tsunemi Kubodera, the scientist at the National Museum of Science in Tokyo, who discovered and photographed the giant squid for the first time, alive. <clears throat> he allowed her to use depth charts, instrument instrumentation grids, and his own research data in the making of this book. Anyone who has experience with letterpress printing will appreciate the tour de force of technique she has accomplished. It is nothing short of sublime. First, Shapers wanted a paper that was translucent, but would become opaque with dark ink, echoing the depths of the ocean. In addition, it had to be as strong as it was thin. She finally found a cache of 50-year-old Toshiban Genshi paper that was used for old mimeograph machines. What, she didn't, what you wouldn't know and what you might not know unless you have spoken to her is that that slit that you see here, that fold there, is actually the amount of space that one has underwater looking through the viewfinder of the camera. And I learned this from her, from talking about it. I always tell people the best way to get more information is to know the artists and speak to them. Shapers has created a murky underwater world that alludes to the mystery and enormity of the discovery of this mythic creature who was known even to Ptolemy and Columbus. You can ha practically hear the sound of ocean waves in the rustling of the ultra-thin tissue paper. And here's a close-up of the DNA of the Architoitus, the scientific name. The flexible translucent vellum covers are a tactile reminder of a once living animal. And a final touch is the magnificent hard acrylic clear enclosure that she put it in, an allusion to my mind of a scientific specimen box. I'm going to end with a quote by Maurice Blanchot who said, to read is thus not to obtain communication from the work, but to make the work communicate itself. By multiple languages beyond text, these artists have compelled us, the readers, to do just that. Thank you. Present time, back in time to its making, 
but it goes back and forth in different chapters. So you meet 19th century conservators who absconded with some of it. You meet the, well, I won't give it away, but it's a great book, very well written. And I'm a critic of a lot of those books because if it isn't accurate, I stop. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I forgot to thank my graphic designer, Richard Zoft, who's here. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> I happen to be married to him. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, in, in the selection of some of the books, uh, I think what's very interesting is what you reveal about them, since we don't have them as objects to, to look at ourselves. Um, uh, is there, can you tell us more about some book that's not evidence or that you didn't reveal about them that would add more information and more understanding about them? Because I know there's so many different things. Uh, yeah, uh, which one? <laughs> uh, how the Bakken book was printed. Oh! Uh, I, you may know more about that than I do, but what he told me, the Botnik book is the B is for Beckett. Did I mention that the page numbers are also backwards? <laughs> students have pointed that out, and it, it actually, students have read it so much that I've had to tell them to stop reading it to keep it closed, because um, it's not really meant to be flipped through. <laughs> <laughs> um, he had to print it on the foredge, but just enough so that he had to register. I'm getting a nod that looks like I'm saying this. Okay, well, Mr. Smarty Pants here wants to tell us. <laughs> uh, 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 the, uh, the text appears on the foredges of the book, but it's not printed on the foredge. It's printed a little, a little, a little bit. A little, yeah. He's moving the form one point at each time, one point. Right. About, yeah. So there's no printing on the forehead, even though you read it on the forehead. I'll show you. I didn't know that. I just wasn't saying it properly. Where's the book? Where's the book? It was not trimmed. No. No, so this is it. You can see here that there's only some of the type on, on the page. Every Every subsequent run of the press, he had to move it just a millimeter or two, whatever that amount was. One so, point. One point. Yeah. So it had to be registered every single time. Were you helping him? Uh, he was doing that again this summer on something else. So he oh, said, really? yeah, one point later. I said, yeah, OK. So he would just be, <laughs> yeah. would just yeah. take an impression, put in one point. But the whole thing about that book that I love is how absurd it is that the book weighs about 10 pounds. And you keep looking for something in it besides that. That's all there is. And it's never complete until the book is closed. Does anyone want to talk about whether these things should be in the library? Why does he call this press M dash? Is that relevant? Well, we, we know what an M dash is. It's a certain space. You'd have to ask him that. I can't channel him right now. <laughs> does anyone know? What is the question? Why does he call his press the M dash press? And it's always lowercase, too. I don't know, but I'll get right on it. <laughs> okay. Ruth, yes? You talked about the weight of the books. Mm -hmm. What about the movement of the books? What do you think about? books that move in unusual ways, or you know, none of these look like they were meant to move in unusual ways. Well, I had, with, with Ines von Kettlebolt's book, that really is about movement. It's about the fact that it was made while she was moving, so that, that's a little bit different. Um, there are other books. In, in the exhibition I did at uh, Leslie in April, there was a whole category called movement. Uh, motion and movement or something like that. And there's quite a, a number, I think probably 10 books that are all about movement. One of them hangs from a string. Do you remember that one? It, had, it has leaves that open out and it's on barometric pressure. It's a poem about, it's called Bubble High and it's in that catalog. And that one can only be appreciated while it's moving. Um, I can't remember what else is in there, but it's, it's something that I've considered a lot. And, Everything about the ways that we read interests me, and I would be happy to get suggestions from any of you 
about other ways that our senses are aroused in reading that is not just about the text. Yes? Well, so I have one smell. Yes. Most especially the bell the, uh, the last one I showed you, Veronica's book, I'm really happy she decided to put it inside heavy plexiglass because the smell of the ink is fresh every time you open it and it smells chemical like a preserved animal. <laughs> I grew up in my father's uh, medical laboratory, and I remember that smell. It smells like formaldehyde. Um, I do have a category of smell books. Actually, there, there's one that I can think of. It's called Hunger, um, and it's by Anna Hepler. She made it while she was a student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. My compliments. And uh, it was, um, it's little packages of uh, spices. It's, it has meaning. It's not just about what she could do, because it's also pretty virtuosic. It's all hand-sewn. But it's about hunger and, and where hunger comes from. So uh, in a way, it's like looking at an illuminated manuscript. You have to really breathe deep and think about it while you read. Yeah. I'm very cautious, though, about books that seem to do something showy but leave you feeling hungry. <laughs> Anyone else? Have, yeah. Have you run across any books that uh, where the artist wants you to be doing a certain thing while you're experiencing the book, such as moving, walking, carrying the book, you know, in a certain way, or eating? We were just <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. I know there are edible books, but I haven't bought any. Uh, <laughs> can you think of any? Well, I'm talking about the press. I mean, really, you know, any yeah. books that are in my model. Yeah. Or, I know what you're talking about. I've seen those. But, but I wonder, does the artist sometimes say, please to appreciate this book. Yeah. Do, do something. Do something. Do well, something. you know. Rather than just moving, maybe moving yourself or have I do have two rules, however, for, for my collection, because it's a library and it's a rare book library and it's primarily rare books, it has to fit on a shelf and I have to want to read it more than once. That part is obvious. but. Fitting on a shelf is important. So if it's something very sculptural that requires a gallery or requires a vitrine, it just doesn't fit. I'm thinking um, small, small things. things. That, uh, yeah. Yeah. Like well, it might be time for you to make that. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, I, I can think. I can think of your book. Um, you know, uh, Neo. Um, yeah, Neo Emblemata Nova. Um, Daniel Kelm's book is based on a 17th century book by Michael Meyer, printed in about 1620. We have that book in my collection, and I love showing it with your book, because that book requires a lot of ingenuity and a lot of moving and interacting, and it's not static. Um, and I like that. And it, it's very alchemical. And you can eat it, too. You can eat it? Didn't I tell you I already ate it? It's gone. I already ate it. <laughs> ah, it's on your list. <laughs> I haven't memorized it yet, but, um, but on your list, somebody can read it out. Um, it's very square, and I didn't give you the thickness of it. It's two inches, probably, or more thick. It's just the moving of that form one point at a time. Talk to Ken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Staggers yeah. 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 It's a high level of craft. Another thing I really appreciate. Yeah. Well. And another thing yeah. that Ken ran into with that book is the adhesive for the spine. Yes. Because if you use certain <laughs> adhesives, the normal ones, the book won't close down. That's firmly. right. And, and I discovered that by showing it to students one too many times. Um, because I show so many artist books to students and the, the number of classes is increasing, um, I noticed that many of them are getting worn. Uh, this one got worn before its time, and luckily because I, know, I knew that Ken was here this past summer in Western Mass, I had to ship it to Daniel Kelm's studio and have it fixed. And now he told me, he said, tell your students not to open it. So. <laughs> I, 
I seriously would be happy to take uh, suggestions of other things that I could add to my list. Or other, I mean, I've only shown you a few books, except nine books. There's many more. But I don't want to keep you away from the book fair. And it's almost 5 o'clock, so. One more? How these books come to your attention? Do you get to do a lot of sleuthing? Do people come to you? Yeah. Not overwhelmed, but the longer I've done this, the more particular I get. Um, a lot of people call themselves book artists, and that can be difficult. <laughs> um, I, so I get a lot of just you know uh, people who are interested in having their books seen but also going to book fairs and uh, particularly knowing artists and having them get in touch with you, artists I've purchased from before. Um, the best book fair by far, besides Frankfurt, which I usually can't go to, is Codex. Have anyone, anyone been there? Codex International Book Fair is fantastic. It's a symposium and a book fair. And frank, frankly, it's Frankfurt West because it's even bigger than Frankfurt in terms of artist books. Um, and you meet artists from all over the world, and I really want to include more international books. You, you notice that I have a lot of international books here. Um, mainly, it's because I feel you know, American libraries are just too insular. We need much more international art, and, and I really should be going on a trip to go find them, but nobody's funding me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so very much. much.